so much, Julia. Uh, my name is Jerry Reynolds. I'm head of outreach with the Museum of Natural Sciences, and uh, we are so glad to have you join us tonight to learn more about fireflies and also to learn about how you can help us learn more about a very special firefly in our area. Uh, I'm, I'm joined tonight by what we call the Carolina Ghost Hunt Team. Uh, I know it sounds like a bad rock band or a bad <laughs> movie from the 80s. There was a movie from the 80s, wasn't there? A anyway, uh, joining me tonight is Chris Goforth, Head of Citizen Science with the Museum of Natural Sciences, and Dr. Clyde Sorensen, Professor of Entomology at North Carolina State University. And we're gonna we're gonna do a tag team. Uh, so it's gonna be like three different presenters. Uh, Chris Goforth is going to start things off to give us a good overview about this wonderful group of insects that we call fireflies or lightning bugs or whatever you call them. And then after she finishes, uh, Dr. Sorensen is gonna talk more about this special group of fireflies that we're really interested in learning more about that we have a great opportunity now in this area to do so. And then I'm going to follow up with give you some guidance in terms of how to hunt for this special ghost firefly. So with that, you know, get ready to learn and uh, enjoy uh, this really great group of insects that's part of our biodiversity. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Goforth. All right, let me just share my screen here really quickly. All right, I'm hoping you all can see that. Uh, I am going to introduce the fireflies in general uh, before we dive into um, a special group of them. Uh, Probably a lot of you have seen fireflies before. You might call them lightning bugs. You might call them fireflies. There's lots of other names for them. Um, I actually switched from calling them lightning bugs to fireflies when I moved to North Carolina. Uh, I don't know why exactly, but amazing, amazing animals and uh, very excited to introduce them to you today. So the first thing I want to cover is what a firefly is, kind of where they're situated within um, the group of organisms that make up our our global biodiversity. So fireflies are insects. Uh, you probably all know this. That means they've got um, three body segments, six legs, two antennae, um, four wings. And within the insects, they are a special type of insect. They are beetles. Uh, that means that they have elytra, uh, which are the hardened upper wings uh, that protect the membranous flight wings that they have underneath. Um, beetles are really, great at getting into all kinds of different environments, um, partly because of that that hardened upper wing, the elytra, um, and uh, uh, the fireflies are no exception to that. And then within the beetles, the fireflies belong to the family Lampyridae, and so these are the, the beetles that light up, um, and we'll talk about how that works here in just a little bit. So there are certain characteristics of fireflies that you can use to kind of identify these relative to all the other beetles. Um, you probably know there are lots and lots and lots of beetle species on our planet. Uh, so the fireflies make up a fairly small group amongst all the beetles, but they've got characteristics that they share. Uh, so one is that they're fairly soft-bodied insects. Even those elytra, those hardened upper wings, are relatively soft. They're um, very flexible as beetles go. Um, pretty easy to squish um, compared to some other beetles. They do keep their heads tucked down under their thorax. Uh, so that pink and black part uh, up at the front there, that is the prothorax, the first section of the thorax, and their heads kind of tucked down under that. So you don't usually see too much of the head sticking out past the, the body, the thorax there. Uh, they have five toes, um, also called tarsi, if you want to be technical, uh, on each foot. And many of them have light producing organs. Now, there are lots of fireflies that don't have light producing organs. So not all fireflies light up. Um, I'm from the Southwest originally. We did not have fireflies that lit up, but there are definitely still fireflies there. Uh, members of the, the family Lampyridae, but um, 
they did not have the light producing organ. Here we do have a lot of them have the light producing organ, which is amazing. And so just as a comparison, we've got the firefly there on the left. And then this is a soldier beetle here on the right. Uh, you can see that they can look very, very similar. Soldier beetles often tend to be pretty soft bodied. They're about the same shape as the fireflies. This one here looks very similar to the firefly. But you can see that head really sticking out. Uh, and um, that can give you a really good indication you're looking at a different type of beetle. So as far as diversity goes, um, these beetles are a relatively decent sized group um, of beetles. There's about 2200 species and about 110 genera worldwide. Uh, and there's a lot of fireflies that look really similar. So in certain genera, it's really hard to tell them apart. So these numbers kind of fluctuate up and down a lot, <laughs> depending on new species being found, um, splitting apart species that are actually two species and whatnot but about 2200 species and 110 genera in the world. In the US, we've got about 170 species and about 10 genera. And then in North Carolina, it's a little bit tricky to figure out exactly how many we have, um, looking at all the different sources that I could come up with, uh, including the NC State Insect Collection, Bug Guide, and a few other places. Um, I was only able to identify eight genera that we have in North Carolina, and Clyde might be able to specify this a little bit more specifically later. Uh, and the number of species is a little bit uncertain. Um, there's a lot of things identified just down to the genus level and not necessarily further than that. Um, so we could have eight species, we could have more. All right, so fireflies are most well known for this light that they produce. Uh, they're a type of bioluminescent organism. They're producing light um, through a chemical reaction that they can control inside their bodies. So their light producing organ has a bunch of different chemicals in it that can mix in certain ways and um, produce light. And I'm not really great at chemistry, so I'm not really gonna go over this uh, that much. Um, this is the, the diagram of how this reaction works, uh, but basically you're mixing energy and, and enzyme and a chemical called luciferin, and that is producing some other chemicals uh, and gives off light. Uh, so it's, a, it's all chemistry. The fireflies have a lot of control over how this reaction works and so that they can produce certain types of light, certain flash patterns uh, within that light organ, um, but it's all just chemistry ultimately. Um, inside the beetles. So it's important to think about why they light up in the first place. Um, most fireflies are either crepuscular or nocturnal, so they're uh, active either at dusk or after dark. Uh, so if you're an animal that is active in the dark and you're trying to find other members of your species to reproduce, you need some way to actually communicate with them. A lot of nocturnal animals use pheromones. Um, the fireflies don't really use pheromones so much. Um, I think they have some pheromones as well, but they're really relying mostly on that light uh, organ. So that light organ helps them communicate with each other. So especially when you're looking at um, individuals trying to find mates, they are using a light to figure out where other individuals of their species are so that they can reproduce. There's also some uh, evidence that fireflies have some pretty nasty chemicals in them. Uh, if you are an animal that's flying around in the dark and you're lighting a big light, um, letting everything know that you're there, uh, that's not necessarily good for your, um, your long-term survival. Um, so it's thought that these fireflies, and again, Clyde, you can probably say something more about this as well, uh, have some pretty nasty chemicals in them. And this light is letting predators know that they maybe don't want to eat these guys. And then there are some fireflies that use their light to actually cheat. And I'll talk about this here in just a moment. So for the most part, um, most of the common species that we see in this area, you're going to have kind of this system where the males are flying around and they're flashing a particular light pattern as they, they fly. They are looking around for females uh, as they fly and giving off this light pattern. 
if a female sees the light pattern, uh, she's usually sitting on a plant or some other stationary object. Uh, and <laughs> she'll give um, a response call. So the, the male will fly, give this flash pattern that is calling out to the females, and then the female will give another flash pattern, might be the same one, might be different depending on the species, uh, that lets the male know that he's there. And they can flash towards each other, um, the male can follow that light down to the female, and then they can mate and reproduce. So here's three examples of flash patterns of um, species that are found in the mountains in North Carolina. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this one too much because uh, Clyde's going to talk a lot more about this one later, um, the blue ghost. Um, the Futura species are often called paparazzi or flash bulb or Christmas light fireflies because they have this very kind of steady flash that they do. Um, they kind of blink on and blink off and blink on and blink off. And so there's different kind of lengths of time between a flash, how long they keep the flash on, that will help you distinguish a little bit between which exact Fotura species you're looking at. Um, but they tend to have that kind of pattern. And then down on the bottom, we've got um, Photinus pyralis. This is a very, very common species here, probably the one that most people think of when they think of fireflies in our area. Uh, it's called the Big Dipper, or the J Flash um, Firefly a lot, common Eastern Firefly is another name, um, but the males light their light, they dip down and then they um, fly up, giving this kind of J pattern. And then there's certain length of time between each J uh, that they flash as well. All right, and the last thing I want to talk about before I hand it over to Clyde are the cheaters. Um, this is one of the classic stories you hear in every entomology class you ever take. Um, there is one group of fireflies uh, in the Fraturus genus that is predatory, uh, and they will cheat by flashing the response call of females from other species. And so they'll sit on a plant or another stationary object. They'll watch for the male flash call of other species lure that male in by responding with the female flash call from that species uh, and then eat that male when it arrives. And so some of these uh, individuals are using the flash patterns to hunt and not just uh, attract mates or find mates or advertise um, impalability. So this is a really cool group of fireflies, that got really giant eyes, um, and it's pretty impressive to watch these guys do their thing. All right, well, that is what I have. So I'm going to pass it over to Clyde so he can tell you more about the ghost fireflies, which are a really amazing group of fireflies. All right, let's see if I can get everything squared <laughs> away here. Let's see. Are we in the right spot, maybe? Yeah. Yep. Looks, yeah, looks good, Clyde. All right, great. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about a, a really fascinating group of little tiny fireflies. Um, they're um, much smaller than the ones that most of you are probably familiar with. And this is a, a group of fireflies that, that we uh, put in the genus Phalsis. So these are the ghost fireflies, and they're really cool because they keep their lights on, those few species that actually have lights. All right, so before I get very much further, I want to kind of reorient y'all with the uh, geography, uh, the anatomy of a firefly, because there are some terms there that can be useful. Um, uh, so important parts that we look at when we're trying to sort out what species of firefly we're looking at, uh, often would include things like the antennae. Different kinds of fireflies have uh, pretty different shaped antennae. Um, the compound eyes that are really prominent in most species, the males have much bigger eyes than the females um, because they're looking, of course, for females real aggressively. Um, the pronotum uh, that, that uh, Chris mentioned, that's the top part of the front of the thorax. And in fireflies, that pronotum is really important in helping us identify what kind of firefly we're looking at. Um, not just in um, the colors that you might see on the pronotum, but also in the pronotum shape. And so from one species of firefly to another, that, that can be an important uh, thing to look for. 
right behind the pronotum is the top plate on the middle thoracic segment. We call that the scutellum. And the color of the scutellum often is important in helping us uh, sort out what species it is we're looking at. And then the elytra. The elytra, uh, the singular is elytron, are the front wings, as Chris mentioned. Um, and the color, um, the uh, shape, and importantly for some groups, like the one we're going to talk about now, the texture of the elytra can be important in helping us identify who it is we're talking about. Um, in a lot of fireflies, there's also this structure called an elytral fold, um, which uh, again, the presence, the absence, how it looks can help you identify species. All right, so we're going to talk to you now about the genus Phalsus. And Phalsus means uh, uh, lit, so, or lighted. Uh, so um, that's, a, I guess, kind of a, a neat little piece of information to, to go with. The Lampyrid means um, light bearer, and that's the, the, the family that all these things belong to. So the genus Phalsus is uh, composed of at least 10 species of uh, fireflies in North America. Um, I say at least because there are almost certainly uh, several species uh, that exist that we just haven't identified yet. And again, these things are tiny compared to most other uh, fireflies. The males average less than a quarter inch in length, and some of them can be sm considerably smaller than that. So they're really, really quite small. In this genus, the females never get wings. They're what we call larviform, and I'll show you a picture of the female of uh, one of the species that we're interested in talking to you about tonight in a moment. Um, and uh, in all species, the females have light organs. They may have only two little light spots. They may have sometimes as many as eight or nine light spots, but the females do glow. In most of the species, though, the males are dark. They don't have light organs. And so uh, as far as we know, in at least in eastern North America, there are only two described species that do have light organs. Um, I say described species because I'm pretty certain we got undescribed species that also have light organs. And we'll talk more about those light organs in just a second. And by far the most uh, familiar of the fireflies in uh, this genus uh, are the hosts. And that species is Phalsus reticulata. So belongs to the genus Phalsus reticulata refers to the texture of the wings. And we'll look at that in just a second. So the blue ghost is um, certainly the most uh, uh, familiar. We'll talk more about it in a minute, but I wanted to first give you kind of a overview of the life uh, cycle for most of these uh, insects in this genus. So in most of these species, the, the flightless females will emerge uh, in the spring, and that could be very early in the spring. Uh, we think for one of our species that it's quite early, maybe as early as in March in North Carolina, or it could be later into May or even June. Um, those females emerge and they're only apparent uh, in a given year for a few weeks um, each year. Um, and the adults are only apparent for uh, uh, a few weeks each year. This is an, uh, a kind of animal that spends most of its life as an immature. All right, so the bulk of its life is actually the immature stage in the, in the soil. So when those females come up, they usually have a little burrow or some other kind of little hidey hole that they, that they inhabit while they're um, looking for mates. So they come up at night at the right time of night and they'll uh, basically put the little bottoms into the air and turn their lights on and advertise for males. The males um, will be flying somewhere between one and four feet above the forest floor. And what they're looking for is that little tiny green light down on the on the forest floor that might signal a female. When they see that little green light, the males basically just fall out of the sky and land as close as they can um, to that uh, source of that little green light. And they'll run over, they'll uh, introduce themselves to the female and if everything works right, 
they mate. Um, ghost fireflies, unlike lots of other fi fireflies, only mate uh, for about 15 minutes. Some other fireflies, like uh, like the Big Dipper that Chris was talking about, they'll still stay paired up for several hours before they um, finish uh, the mating process. Uh, once a female mates, she ceases uh, calling anymore. She won't uh, she won't uh, advertise for mate any longer. What she will do is she'll go down into the soil, down into her burrow, and she'll lay a batch of about 25 to 30 eggs. And then she guards those eggs until she uh, basically starves herself to death. And then sometime after she dies, those eggs hatch and the little tiny larvae will uh, disperse across the forest floor and they make their living uh, feeding on soil and vertebrates. And they're actually really aggressive little predators. So they're tiny, but they can, they can uh, subdue uh, prey that are much larger than they are. And it may take them, depending on which species you're talking about, which particular prey item they manage to catch, it may take them many days to actually finish consuming uh, a, a prey that they uh, that they've uh, uh, subdued. But to be truthful, we still don't know a whole lot about exactly what happens to these fireflies and how they live their life for most of the year. We're really only uh, somewhat familiar with um, the adults. All right, so let's talk about uh, reticulata, Phyllis uh, reticulata. This is the blue ghost. Um, the blue ghost um, uh, males can range from uh, a little less than a quarter inch to on the outside. Sometimes they get almost as much as a half inch in length, but that's really exceptional. Um, so this is the dorsal uh, aspect of a male um, blue ghost, and you'll see this patterning on the wings, this kind of net like set of ridges. That's where the name reticulata comes from. So. Blue ghosts are exceptional because uh, in amongst fireflies that we're most of most of us are familiar with because um, they have uh, well-developed light organs. I'll show you that in just a minute. And when the males are looking for females, they keep their lights on for sometimes as long as uh, 30 or 45 seconds, and then they'll turn it off for a short while and turn it back on. Um, and when you have large numbers of these things uh, flying around over the forest floor, it's actually pretty magical. The first time I ever saw them myself was up um, just outside of Damascus, uh, Virginia, along a river up there that parallels the uh, Appalachian Trail. We were hiking, my son and I and some other scouts were hiking the Appal part of the Appalachian Trail. And um, we set up camp and we we're sitting there um, after dinner uh, just enjoying a campfire and I I glanced behind me and I saw all these little bluish green lights just milling around. I'm talking about maybe a couple hundred of them milling around over the forest floor and of course being an entomologist and having never seen anything like this before I wanted to see what it was but the frustrating thing is is if you don't have a net you don't see the firefly because as soon as you get close they turn their light off and since they're only about a quarter inch long and dark, uh, and it's already 45 minutes or more after dark, um, you just can't see them when they turn the light off. I, I like to imagine what it was what, what it was like for those early Scottish settlers up in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, I think they were a fairly superstitious lot, and, and you know here they are camping out, um, trying to get uh, a homestead set up, and 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 all of these little spirits start appearing and you can't tell what it is because when you get close they disappear like little fairies dancing through the woods it's uh it's really pretty magical um so the primary flight period for uh, reticulata for the blue ghost in north carolina um, starts somewhere in the middle of may most years in most of the areas where they're found and goes maybe into june and uh, sometimes there's another smaller peak later in the summer. All right, so this is what the back looks like. Uh, one other thing before we move on, I want you to look at the pronotum, and I want you to notice that it's like most fireflies, it has a large shield-shaped pronotum, but it's also got windows in its pronotum, so it can see above it and below it at the same time because it basically can look through these windows uh, above it. 
And also, before we get to the other uh, type that I want you to pay attention to uh, critically for us, I want you to notice that on this insect, um, the pronotum has a large dark wedge shape in the middle of it. And um, a lot of the pronotum has some color to it. All right, this is the, the belly of a reticulata male. And these bright white spots here are its light organs. So these are the structures that it uses to house that chemical reaction that Chris was uh, talking about. One of the cool things to know about firefly light is, is that it's extraordinarily energy efficient. Basically, all the chemical energy that goes into the reaction comes out as light. And there's no waste heat generated in this kind of light production, which is really, really cool. I also want you to notice that they have massive eyes. And if you look carefully, they don't have much in the way of mouth parts because they don't eat as adults. Um, so, and that's why they only last for a couple of weeks. They basically starve themselves to death looking for mates. This um, insect is uh, really, really uh, becoming quite, quite uh, um, famous. There are several places um, in the uh, mountains of North Carolina where you can see them. They're called blue ghosts, but if you look, the light's not actually blue. It's only blue at a distance, and that's due to an optical illusion called the Perginke effect. So when you look at a pale or a, a, a faint green light at any distance, it color shifts towards the blue end of the spectrum, but they're actually green. By the way, this is a picture taken by a friend of mine who's a really noteworthy um, naturalist who's been studying fireflies of all kinds for about 30 years, Lynn Faust. And so that's a male blue ghost, and this is the female. And you can see she looks more like a, 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 a larval insect than she does an adult. This is um, as much as she's ever going to look uh, like a beetle. All right, so this map depicts the um, known distribution of blue ghost fireflies in North Carolina as we currently understand it. I guarantee you that they are probably distributed all across the mountain and foothill district of North Carolina. But we're going to be asking you to help us uh, sort out an important question right around here. We're very interested in also knowing about where reticulata occurs. So if you're in the mountains already or if you plan on being in the mountains during May and June, we'd sure appreciate you looking for reticulata in the mountains as well. OK, so um, the most famous of the Faustus fireflies is reticulata. Um, there are several other species in the genus. As I said, there's 10 that we have identified so far. One other that occurs in North Carolina is extremely uh, poorly known. This is Faustus inexensa. Inexensa means without light. So this is one of the dark species. Its common name is the shadow ghost because the males don't have a light. The females do have two little light spots. Um, and they put a little green uh, tail up in the air when they're calling for males. Um, but as you might expect, it's really hard to detect this insect because only the male have, or females have light. And how in the world can you find the males without finding the females first? Um, this, this species probably averages a little bit smaller than, um, than uh, reticulata does. Um, they probably fly earlier than reticulata does when, where they both occur. And they're probably found right on across North Carolina, but we really know very little about them. Um, so this is a, a, one of those black holes in natural history we're trying to, to fill. It's important for y'all to know about in extensa because uh, it appears to be um, more closely related to the critters we're interested in trying to find than reticulata is. All right, so let's get to a couple kinds of uh, falsus that um, we don't really understand at all well. One of these, actually, uh, we're not sure whether it occurs in North Carolina or not. It may be the same thing that we're looking for here in North Carolina. But this is a form called the Low Country Ghost. And so um, Lynn uh, Faust and several other uh, entomologists in South Carolina have been trying to figure what's, you know, what's going on here. This is a 
a glowing falsus species that occurs in lowland habitats in the coastal plain of South Carolina. Um, it appears to uh, have light organs very similar to reticulatas and a glow very much like reticulata. Um, but uh, we don't really know very much at all about it, apart from the fact that there it is down in the coastal plain of, uh, of South Carolina. The red uh, stars on this map, by the way, indicate the known distribution of reticulata in South Carolina. So in South Carolina, true reticulata is pretty much restricted to um, the mountains and the foothills of the mountains in far western South Carolina. And this thing, by the way, this low country ghost flies um, in March, which is quite a bit earlier than reticulata flies in the mountains. So in the mountains of South Carolina, reticulata is going to be flying again in May. Um, and here it is, this thing, whatever it is, undescribed species, weird reticulata, something else, we don't know, um, is flying in March. Okay, so let's go back to North Carolina and let's talk about our big mystery, and that's what we're calling for the time being the Piedmont ghost. Um, we don't know what this is. We don't know if this is an undescribed species, that's sort of my um, feeling, um, or uh, a weird population of in excess of that actually glows. We're not sure exactly what it is, but we do know that in the Piedmont of North Carolina, we have glowing falsus ghost fireflies. So Jerry and I have just been taken to calling them Piedmont ghosts because we don't really know what the heck else to call them. This is the dorsal aspect of one of our glowing ghosts. And for one thing, I want you to notice that the wings are not as you'll pardon the uh, description, reticulated as the wings of uh, reticulata. They're a little bit smoother. This insect also tends to average a little bit smaller than reticulata, at least in what we've been able to get a, our hands on so far. And if you'll notice, this thing has massive windows in its pronotum. You can see its entire eyes from the top. And if you remember, I'll show you a comparison picture in just a second. If you remember reticulata has um, this large dark mark that comes up into its up into its uh, pronotum. So the markings are quite different. The windows are much larger um, than on reticulata, and you can see the whole eyes. And that large dark mark is missing from the middle of this guy's uh, pronotum. This is the underside of um, our Piedmont ghosts. And one thing that you'll notice right off is that the light organs look different. All right. The light organs are smaller and kind of maybe a little bit more diffuse. And consequently, the glow on these things is fainter than the glow on the blue ghosts of the mountains. But it's very much there, as Jerry will attest. Right. Another thing that you can notice is that this structure here, this tail part of the abdomen, is more forked on ours than it is on uh, reticulata. So here's the dorsal aspects of reticulata to the bottom and um, our Piedmont ghost, whatever the heck it is, to the top. You can see again that the elytra on our Piedmont ghosts are smoother. Um, the head maculation or the pronotum maculation is quite different, and the windows on the pronotum are just massive compared to uh, the windows on the pronotum of the blue ghost. And this is just giving you a comparison of the undersides again, so you can see the smaller uh, light organs on our ghost firefly, the Piedmont ghost, um, versus the big distinct light organs on reticulata and notice again here how it's forked more prominently on our Piedmont ghost than it is on um, reticulata on the blue ghost. By the way, this is more similar to in excess as well than uh, this is. So in a lot of respects, this thing looks like it's more closely related in excess, but in excess is dark. 
um, the males are dark and our guys glow. And they, once you eyes it, once your eyes adapt to the dark, they glow quite prominently. It's not at all hard to see. In fact, the, the uh, every time we see them, we just get tickled with ourselves. It's so cool. All right. So these are the adult males. This is an adult female. You're looking at her belly. All right. So here are her six legs. Um, you can actually, if you use just a tiny bit of imagination, you can actually see eggs through her integument, her light organs, and she's only going to have two are back here at the tail end. Um, you can't actually see the light organs on the female because the organs themselves are pretty much the same color as everything else on the female. And again, notice that she doesn't have much in the way of mouth parts because she's not going to eat as an adult. This is the female from the side. Again, the light organs are back here. And all the females that we found so far only have two light spots, which makes them distinct from um, most reticulata where the females have between four and sometimes as many as 12 light spots on the females. All right, so this map shows you the known distribution of what we're calling the Piedmont ghost, whoever he is and she is, all right? And so we have several known populations now in Chatham County. We need to expand this to the west. Do they occur over here? Do they occur in Randolph County? Um, do they occur uh, in Orange and Durham and Granville County? I'm betting they do, but we need people to help us find them. We have one well-documented population now in Wake County. This is actually at Durant Nature Park or a good friend of ours, John Connor, remembered seeing them 40 years ago. And when I reminded him of the, the possibility of something like this, he went, oh yeah, I think I remember seeing something like that a way back. And then we have a couple populations here in Johnston County, but I'm not gonna tell you about them. I'm gonna let Jerry tell you about them. This blue star marks um, a report of a ghost firefly population in, um, in uh, Western Montgomery County. It's a good uh, report. I don't have any material from it, so I don't know which kind of ghost firefly it is. My suspicion is that it is our Piedmont ghost and not reticulata from the mountains. But this is a question we need to answer. So we're gonna be interested in getting people from all over to uh, get out and um, start looking for ghosts. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry, who is going to, um, if I can figure out how to get my sharing stop. I'm going to figure out how to do that. I'm going to turn it over to Jerry. Jerry, do you want to see if you can just. Yeah, let me see if I can go ahead and share and mine. Maybe that'll pop you off. <laughs> here we go. I can, I can stop my share right now. So now it's on to you. All right, let me see. Let me see if I can share what I want to share. Uh, Julie, you may have to coach me a little bit. It's like I don't want to X out. Bring it back up. Let me see. Share. Yeah, uh, Jerry, you're sharing your screen now, so you should just be able to pull up your presentation on the page on the uh, screen you have now. Oh, okay, I got you. Now, let me see if this works. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Deja vu. We did this before, right? There you go. Now you're sharing your presentation. Okay, great. Well, well, Chris and Clyde, thank you so much. And I'm sure our, our audience really learned a lot. And I continue to learn a lot, too, because I'm certainly not a firefly uh, expert. But anyway, we, you've learned a lot, but you've also learned that there's a lot that we don't know. So that's where you come in. So I'm going to tell you about the Carolina, what we're calling the Carolina ghost hunt here, and I hope that you will join us uh, on this hunt. Now, in terms of hunting these Piedmont ghosts, uh, you know, we, as Clyde showed you, we just know of a few locations in central North Carolina where this mis this mysterious, uh, undescribed, potentially undescribed uh, Piedmont ghost exists. So we want you out there looking because we can only cover so much ground and we want your help. And what we're trying to determine is where do these things occur? Uh, when are they 
when are they active with their uh, reproduction, uh, all kinds of things we want to document to help map this you know, new new form out for us. So so even we're calling it the Carolina ghost hunt, but as uh, Clyde mentioned, you know there are things going on in South Carolina. So we, you know, if anyone in the audience is from South Carolina, we hope that you will look too. Uh, we're we're focusing on Central North Carolina because that's where we know of some of the populations now. But but we don't want you to assume that they're not in your area just because you're further out of range. The the very at the beginning of last year, the only known population of this Piedmont ghost was in Chatham County, and uh, and Clyde you know did some searching and. And eventually uh, learned that John Connors knew of their existence for over 40 years in Durant Nature Park. And that's a really cool story in itself in that uh, John, and I think John's in our audience tonight, uh, yeah, he was a uh, naturalist leading night hikes for kids back in the 80s. And he saw these really cool fireflies. He didn't know exactly what they were. Uh, he called them phantom fireflies. And uh, he really en enjoyed seeing them every spring with those night hikes. And he just didn't think anything about them because he figured, well, well, everybody knew they were there probably. He just didn't know that they were unknown to science. So so he he's probably the first person to document this undescribed species uh, from observations over 40 years ago. And he returned uh, with Clyde and they're still there. So we went from that one population known in Chatham County to additional ones uh, in Chatham County and that one in Wake County. Well, they're also in Johnson County, and that's where I am tonight. I'm in my house in Johnson County, uh, and I'm going to tell you a Johnson County ghost story. Uh, and the, there's going to be a lesson in this story that I hope that you will learn uh, about assumptions when you're looking for something or not looking for something. But anyway, this begins in Johnson County, uh, so hang on, hope, hold on to somebody tight, maybe get a little scary here. And it, uh, uh, they didn't want to hear my ghost story. Okay, well, uh, and yeah, you know, Clyde did turn to social media uh, when he began a search uh, last spring to try to get more people looking for this critter, and I was sharing his post and everything. And so last year, he put this post out on April 5th. Uh, talking about the blue ghost fireflies, that, that we have this evidence of another blue ghost in the eastern Piedmont of North Carolina. And he mentions that that one known population at this time, this is the only one he knew, uh, was that one that was found on private property uh, in Chatham County. So he you know, gave some guidance and how to look and everything. So, so this is really cool. And again, this is April 5th of last year uh, with just knowing about that one known uh, Piedmont population. Well, almost a month later, he comes back online and says we've had success. You know, at least four more sites in, in two counties, Wake and Chatham County, have been identified. And again, he's trying to promote people to continue looking. And, uh, you know, I, when I saw this on, on social media, I thought this was great. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty social. So I responded, that's awesome. Do you think they may occur in our part of Johnson County? And you notice I say our part. Uh, Clyde and I live only about a mile apart, uh, and in part of Johnson County, it's actually fairly close to Wake County, so it seemed to be reasonable. Well, up there in Wake County, could they be in Johnson County? And Clyde responded, well, you know, it's worth looking, and said, and I was thinking, yeah, you know, I should do that. I should go out and look for these critters. Uh, yeah, it is worth looking. Well, about a week later, uh, Clyde responded again to this post and said, any luck? And, uh, it was in the evening. I'd had dinner, a beer, sitting in my recliner, watching something on Netflix. Uh, and I quickly responded, well, you would know if I did. Well, I didn't lie to Clyde, but I didn't really tell him the whole truth. I really hadn't looked. Even though it was worth looking, I really hadn't taken the time to go out and look. And when I responded that way, I really felt bad, you know, I just 
said, that, that was sorry of you, <laughs> you to respond that way and not tell Clyde if you hadn't really looked. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I could look from my recliner and see my backyard and, and uh, uh, I could say, well, I looked, I didn't see anything, but I felt so bad about that. And it was at the right time of the evening. So I said, okay, Jerry, get out of the chair, whatever you're watching on Netflix, you can watch later. Uh, grab a red light, grab a camera, put your boots on. Let's go in the woods behind your house just so you can prove they're not there and not feel bad about how you responded to Clyde's post. So that's what I did. I uh, put on my boots. I trudged through my backyard, crossed the small stream that marks the back part of my property. And then I started trudging up the little slope to where I could get to the top of the wooded hill that's behind my house. So I get a good view of the woods and, and see where the, the blue ghosts are not. Uh, well, while I was trudging up the hill, all of a sudden I thought I saw a little blue light. And I was, my first thought was, well, all right, how many beers did I have with supper? Did I really see that? And then I just sort of looked up where I could see the top of the wooded hill. And there were a couple of dozen uh, blue lights sort of dancing just off the ground, just on top of the hill. I had blue ghost or the Piedmont form of the blue ghost firefly behind my house in Johnson County. I went up there just to prove they weren't there. So I didn't feel bad about my response to Clyde. And there I had them. Uh, so a guilt trip <laughs> led me to get out there that night to discover that I had the ghost fireflies. And of course, I was so excited. Uh, uh, they're small, like Clyde said, and, and I actually found a male that got caught in a spider web. So I actually grabbed that that blue ghost uh, and clenched him in my fist because I wanted to make sure I had a specimen to prove that I really saw him. And I carried that one you know, down to my house. You know, uh, so I had an example and I got in touch with uh, Clyde and we eventually ended up in talking uh, by phone about this. And, and it, I, was, I was pretty excited. It's pretty exciting when you when you are looking for something, not expecting to find it, and then you find it. So this is this is the story of how I discovered blue ghost fireflies living right behind my house. And uh, an interesting thing, and, and again, I, I laugh at myself, and uh, I think Clyde has laughed at himself too, because he had been going to Wake and Chatham counties looking for these fireflies, and he hadn't looked at in the woods behind his house. So after my success, he went behind his house. He has blue ghosts or the Piedmont form of the blue ghost fireflies behind his house too. So, so the lesson there is don't assume, don't assume that you don't know that you don't assume that something's not there until you look at the right time. So, so I, we we laugh about this now, but but uh, it's sort of a fun funny part of the story that we have here. Now, this is the actual firefly that I caught last year with that first trip behind the, behind my house. And, and I you know, did collect this one as a specimen so that we'd have a, a male specimen from that population. Not great photographs, but you can still see the firefly. And then later I did collect one female from that same population too, so that we would have a, fi a female specimen from that, from that subpopulation behind my house. Now, I don't have fancy camera gear, so uh, this is a fuzzy photograph of one of the females that I, uh, that female that I caught. And even with the fuzzy photograph, you can clearly see the two light organs uh, that she has. And again, as, as Clyde mentioned, that's an important distinction for this form of the firefly that we want you to look for if you're lucky enough to find one. Now, now this is where I live, Johnson County. There's my house. You see the patch of woods, about 50 acres behind my house, and there's nothing nothing remarkable about this patch of woods. It's mixed woods, hardwoods, and you can see the pine trees there. Uh, what's remarkable is that the woods are still there if all the development that's going on. And this is where the fireflies were, that close to my house. And I've been living here for almost 20 years, never knew they were back there just because I never went to look for them at the right time of the year and knowing the right protocols to look for them. So, so you may be thinking, well, you might have a patch of woods like this near you right now, maybe behind your house. 
Now, this is a topo map, so you can see that that these tend to be on a, the higher elevation. They're not down, you know, in along the stream. They're up on the higher, drier part of that mixed uh, forest there. So, so that again, this is all to sort of give you some, uh, you know, some targets to look for in your area. Now, this is a drone video that I took of this same area, uh, recent snowstorm, but it really clearly shows how you see all the deciduous trees, and then you see the pine trees, which, which in this case are mostly loblolly pines with some short leaf in there. And this area, part of Johnson County, was probably mostly longleaf pine originally. But anyway, uh, these mixed forests, as far as we know, uh, is where we're finding them now, anyway. Now, this is what it looks like. Again, nothing remarkable. Mixture of hardwoods and pine trees in there. Uh, so all I had to do was go through that backyard gate Maybe you've got a similar situation very close to you, or you know some other property that you have access to. We're really hoping that you will, you know, go out and look. Uh, the Rant Nature Preserve again. John Connors, wow, he documented them here at least mentally <laughs> over four, you know, about forty years ago with those night hikes. And again, if you look at this Google Earth image, you can see uh, it's a mixture of of pine trees and hardwoods. Again, very similar to what's behind my house. So this is just to sort of give you a target of what to look for. And here's the very trail. This is the very trail that John Connors led those kids on uh, down through the woods, down to the lake, observing the, the these phantom fireflies as he caught them on both sides of the trail uh, during that time of the year. So really Really cool. Glad, glad, glad that John remembered that and uh, can make that connection. That I mean, they've been living here for at least forty years uh, uh, that we know of, and certainly much longer than that. So anyway, uh, again, I'm sure you're thinking, well, I've, I've been in woods like that near my place. So that's what that's what we want you to think, and we want you to go look in those places. Now we're, of course, we're coming from you virtually from three separate locations, but the uh, Thomas G. Crowder uh, Woodland Center is right there on the northern section of Lake Johnson Park. And if you look at Lake Johnson Park, while well, look, think the southern section, look at that. I see mixed hardwoods and pine trees. That'd be a good place to go look for them. So Julia, you and your park staff, uh, you got your, you got a, something to add to your list there. And again, I'm, I'm just sharing this with you that you can look at other places uh, just driving through or, or, or use Google Google Earth to search for them. And it's really e pretty easy to search for them. And if you do use Google Earth, uh, they usually tend to come up with an image that shows you where everything is nice and green. You sometimes have to go into the historical imagery just to back it up a little bit so you can get a, get a fall or winter scene so you, that you can truly see the composition of the forest. Uh, because the pine trees will stand out from the hardwoods. So anyway, that's one way to identify areas within your range that might be good places to look. And of course, keep in mind, you don't just go into a park at night. <laughs> that requires a permit, uh, but there may be other property near you that you have access to that you can go safely and legally uh, at night to look for these fireflies. We're, we're hoping that some of the parks will organize some firefly hunts uh, this season to get people out there to help us find these fireflies. So when? Well, this is April 11th, and sometime between mid-April and mid-May is when we think this first flight season of this Piedmont ghost occurs. There, there, we we think there may be a later, uh, a later flight mating period if they follow what the, the, the mountain blue ghosts do. Uh, but now's the time to get out there. I mean, it's 7.55. OK, we're almost at prime time to get out there. So more specifically, uh, they fly during the dark. So you want to get out there about 45 minutes after legal sunset when it's nice and dark. And we think that they're probably only going to be flying when temperatures are above 60 degrees. So a, a fairly warm night like tonight's going to be. 
and you need to watch for about 30 to 60 minutes to make sure that you have an opportunity to catch them at, at that location. Now, after about 60 minutes, if you haven't seen anything, well, maybe they're not there or maybe the conditions are not right for them to fly that night. OK, April 11th, 2022. Sunset tonight is at, was at 744. So 45 minutes after sunset would be 829. So tonight, 829 is the time to be out there and then spend about an hour out there watching for them and uh, maybe you'll find something. So this is just sort of give you guidance you know, in terms of the where and now the when during this roughly four week time period. And even though their their flight period may only be a couple of weeks in there, you know, we're not sure exactly when it begins and when it ends and we want to sort of uh, learn that too. And matter of fact, I've already been looking in the woods behind my house hoping to catch them at the very first flight occurrence. So how? How do you look for them? Well, you just look for them. You know that the, the only thing that's going to be out there with a dim green bluish looking light along the far store right now is going to be this Piedmont form of the Blue Ghost Firefly. Now, I use a red light to go out. Uh, and the red light is not to look for the firefly. The red light is just to help me walk in the dark so I don't step in a stump hole or trip over something or whatever. And you don't use a red light to look for them. Matter of fact, you don't want any light. You want it to, the darker it is, the better. So the red light is just sort of a safety feature for you to get you out there if there's not enough light to get out there safely and to get you back to wherever your vehicle or whatever is. Uh, but when you're looking for the, the fireflies, you don't want any lights. But again, I use a red light just for safety. And the reason why red light is because red light you can see, but it preserves your night vision. If I shine the white light to check out the terrain, then I have to wait for 15 or 20 minutes for my night vision to get back. So that's, you know, astronomers use red lights to preserve their night vision for observing the night sky at night. So that's the purpose of the red light. When you do go out there, I want you to tread very lightly because remember, as you learn that the females are in the leaf litter, you know, attracting the males. So we don't want to be walking over our subject. So tread lightly. Once you determine that they're in the area, don't walk through the area, you know, walk around it. Now that I know where these uh, fireflies are in my section of woods. I sort of try to walk around it to look for them. So, uh, and we of course want you to document this and we're going to give you some more information about exactly how to document them. And of course, we want to know the location, number of males flying, females glowing. And again, the important thing about those light spots on the uh, tail of the females and even a bad blurry photograph clearly shows the two light spots of this uh, female uh, Piedmont ghost firefly. So what if you go out and you don't see any ghosts? Well, you go out again another night. <laughs> Perhaps it wasn't their night, uh, but we're hoping you can keep going back out there because uh, they'll show up perhaps a, no, a different time, different conditions, or maybe they're not there. And that's important information also, so 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 that is important for us if you see them or if you don't see them. So we hope that you'll join us on the hunt. We hope that you'll see a, a blue ghost firefly before it's over. We'll hope you'll see more than one blue ghost firefly before it's over. And uh, on behalf of the uh, Carolina Ghost Hunt team, uh, Clyde, Chris, and I, we want to thank you for being here tonight. I know it's eight o'clock, but I want to bring Chris back on because we do have a website just a few hours old, so we're still tweaking it and all. But I'd like for Chris to just introduce this uh, website that she developed for the Carolina Ghost Hunt. So thank you so much. And Chris, I will let you follow up this shared for those who can stay with us to uh, share the uh, website. Sounds good. This will just take a couple minutes. Um, very very basic while chris is pulling that up i do want to let everyone know this is recorded uh lecture i will be sending out 
a link to the recording along with an EE form for those of you that really have to jump right at eight o'clock. We appreciate you for joining us. All right, here's our website. It's uh, carolinaghosthunt.org. Um, it you'll end up here as the home page. This just kind of welcomes you to the, the page. There's a few links that we think will be the most important down at the bottom, um, but all these links are up here at the top. You can read a little bit more about the things that Clyde talked about tonight about the, the ghost fireflies and see some pictures of the Piedmont ghost um, here just to remember what they're going to look look like. Um, there's information about how to actually participate, so kind of what to what to do, what you need to look for, where you need to look, um, how to make your observations all on this um, participate page. Then we have a report page. Um, we're going to have a paper data sheet that you can download and print and mail to us if you'd like to, but um, we have a Google form now that you can use to make your observations. Um, that printable sheet will be there in the next three or four days, so it'll be, be quick. Uh, there's a little bit of information about all three of us. And then if you have any questions about um, the project or just want to get in touch with someone, you can do that um, through this Contact Us page. Um, or if you know any of us, um, you can contact us directly. And that's really pretty much it for now. Um, we're hoping to put up um, a map of where we have sightings uh, in the future and um, some more information about the, the fireflies so that you can um, really get to know those well. Um, but we hope that you'll you'll make your observations uh, even if you don't see fireflies please feel free to go ahead and fill out a form because that will tell us a lot about um, this species even if you don't see them and chris uh if someone asked in the chat is this on site starter it is not yet but it will be that's my next next plan of attack for um this project <laughs> Uh, I know we are right at our end, um, but if anyone has any uh, questions they would like to ask the ghost hunt team now while you have them in front of you, um, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, otherwise, as Chris had showed you, there's a contact us page um, where you're welcome to do that. Um, and then I know that um, the city of Raleigh, we're working to kind of figure out what we can do, um, but is the museum doing anything where people can participate um, in that? Uh, we haven't organized anything specifically yet, but we hope to do some things. Uh, I, I have received a permit to check Clemens Educational State Forest, so we might need some help with that. But yeah, we, uh, you know, we're a little bit behind in getting things organized for this very short season, but we're going to give it our best. So look, look for more information, um, and that the website that uh, Chris just shared with you is a good place to get that information as we update it. And then Clyde, we have a question for you specifically in the chat about uh, what fireflies are typically found throughout the coastal part of the state. So, yeah, probably the most common firefly in, in most of North Carolina is that big dipper, the Botinus paralis. That's one that's very, very um, common in people's yards. But beyond that, there we have about 30 species of fireflies, at least, I'll put it, at least 30 species of fireflies in North Carolina. And uh, the coastal plain actually has a lot of diversity. So there's there's uh, several species of Paturus. There's one of them that synchronizes its flashes. I have it in my backyard too, which is so cool. <laughs> and um, um, so that's one that you oftentimes will see around uh, uh, kind of wetter habitats. There's uh, another photurist that likes to stay up in the tops of the trees and it looks like Christmas tree lights going off. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Uh, I've, I'm up to, I think, 10 species of fireflies in my yard right now. So, a lot to learn. Um, somebody else asked about um, for taking photos, do you do that without the flash? Uh, if you want to take photos to document the insects, that you're cat that you're uh, uh, encountering um, flash is a good idea that way you can you know zoom in as tight as you possibly can and, and give us the best look at the features and if you're going to take pictures of the fireflies it's great to have pictures of both the top and the bottom um, that would be helpful um, but if you're trying to take pictures of 
uh, fireflies while they're flashing, it's pretty challenging, especially these guys because they're so they're so dim. Um, and um, I mean, really, to have the best success, you have you have to have a kind of a high end camera. That being said, I've gotten halfway decent recognizable videos with just my uh, my uh, my uh, own personal uh, uh, super zoom camera. So, but if you're taking pictures to document them, um, yeah, get as tight as you can uh, with good clear focus and give us a top and a bottom shot. That would be very, very useful. But then uh, would you like participants or people that are trying to help to collect any specimens or leave them to being just photo documentation? Um, at some point we may need some more um, specimens, but a really good picture would go a long way. Um, if you do want to collect material to bring to us, uh, specimens to, to bring to us, the best uh, way to, to uh, store them is in, in alcohol, um, preferably about 70% alcohol. Um, and that'll, that'll keep them in good shape. Um, now, if you are going to collect material, it's also very, very important to take detailed information about when and where you collected it. And then uh, John asked if you were organizing folks to survey Shank. Uh, haven't yet, but we ought to do it. Yeah. There, there, there is so much ground we need to cover in a few weeks. <laughs> Again, that's why we need everyone's help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So is this going to be a new kind of annual thing for, um, for y'all? Is this you know, kind of this is year one, kind of get it together as you can and then, you know, plan for next year. Well, uh, yeah, I think we're going to, but it's going to take a while to figure out exactly where they are. So I don't think we're going to know the answers in one year by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and, and beyond that, you know, it might be fun in subsequent years to maybe add additional species to the hunt and, and we can make fireflies start coming out in April and maybe March around here and some of them don't show up until July and so if you look across the entire species diversity in North Carolina the firefly season is about four months and so there's there's a lot to learn and you can see some really cool things right in your own backyard I have pictures I've taken of the tourists uh, females eating Latinus males right by my back porch light. So there's there's all kinds of cool stuff out there. And it's actually, from my own personal experience, it's extraordinarily distracting. You'll spend, you'll be out wandering around in your backyard till 11 o'clock at night trying to see <laughs> out what you want for the fireflies on your property. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And one other thing I'd add to all that is, is you know, um, they're, they're, they're more than just interesting critters. They're also kind of canaries in the coal mine for us. Um, you know, fireflies are, are habitat sensitive animals and, you know, robust firefly populations are an indication that you've got good habitat. And when they start going away, that's a good sign that something bad is happening in your environment. So the more we know about them, the, the, the better. I think that's all the questions that uh, our participants have. Again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you to the Ghost Hunt team for sharing this awesome uh, opportunity with us. And hopefully we can get out and start finding some of these, these fireflies and documenting some more potential populations. Um, and get the information out there. Again, uh, for those of you that are seeking EE credit, I will be sending out that form later. Uh, um, later this week, along with a link to the recorded presentation. Thank you, everyone. And have a great night. Spread the word. Thank you Here so much. Thank you.